Zealand on air. It's ten past eight. And it's morning report. The former National Party leader Don Brash admits he's a little nervous to speak at Waitangi for the first time since mud was slung in his face there 15 years ago. Dr Brash, who is a spokesperson, one of the members of the Hobson's Pledge group, which opposes what it terms is Māori favouritism, says he was surprised when Ngāpui asked him to give a speech at the Lower Marae tomorrow, especially given his uh, past controversy there. The Minister for Regional Economic Development Shane Jones, though, has a warning for Dr. Brash. If he wants to create a controversy, um, then Waitangi is tailor made for that, but uh, he does need to choose his words carefully, or his message will be overwhelmed by people just protecting him because he's a, he's a has been from a time that's passed us by. Oh, that's Shane Jones. Dr. Brash is with me in the Auckland studio. Tenakwe, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Shane Jones says you're a, you're a man whose time has passed. <laughs> no response <laughs> well, to that. I, I, uh, well, in some sense, uh, uh, in terms of age, uh, that's right. Fifteen years ago, I was at uh, that Marae. Um, I'm delighted to be invited back. I'm going to give a speech and I'm going to listen. Tell me the background as to how this came apart. Well, unexpectedly, I had a, um, a contact through Messenger from Ruben Taipuri. I'd never heard his name before, didn't know whether he had the authority to invite me to uh, Waitangi. Uh, asked me, he said he had um, wanted to contact me via phone. He, we talked by telephone. He said, I've read your autobiography recently and there's a side of Don Brash which the public haven't heard. Um, would you be willing to speak at Waitangi? And I said, I certainly was. Um, incidentally, I don't recall his mentioning Hobson's Pledge at all at that point. So you're not um, speaking on behalf of that group? No, no. You're I'm speaking, speaking as an individual? My, myself. Um, now, clearly, I'm one of the two spokespeople for Hobson's Pledge, and I don't resign from that at all, of course. Um, but but he asked initially for me to talk a bit about economics and, and the prospects for Napui and, and Maori and Northland. OK, and I, I acknowledge that you, you're not going to want to deliver your speech this morning, and um, nor would we perhaps want you to. Um, but um, what are you going to talk about in terms of economics? Uh, well, one of the points we're going to make is that Maori prosperity will not be guaranteed by treaty settlements. It's a point which I actually owe to Rob McLeod, who is a Ngāti Pārō leader, that even if you take all the in, uh, investments in treaty settlements over the last 20-something years uh, and invest that at 5%, it makes minimal difference to the incomes, the annual incomes of ordinary Māori. So, yes, treaty settlements are things which would happen. I don't resign from that at all. I, I'm comfortable with treaty settlements. I've never opposed them. But they aren't the recipe to make ordinary Māori prosperous. What is uh, well, again, <laughs> that's, that's my speech. I won't go into that now. Well, give but, us a couple. Uh, but, a couple. Well, but uh, I think the key point is that it's, it's saying what it isn't is almost as important as saying what it is. Mm. I mean, too many ordinary Maori assume that once they get a treaty settlement, everything will be rosy. And the point that Rob McLeod said, and I quote him, mm. is that that isn't the case. So if you think we're going to suddenly be, make Maori prosperous by hanging around waiting for a treaty settlement, that's a bad mistake. What do you think about the approach of the current government? We've just seen it with this regional development fund and indeed Shane Jones and the Prime Minister announcing this $100 million fund that would try and, uh, you know, give uh, Māori landowners, rural landowners access to that capital that they perhaps can't get from the banks. What do you think about that approach? Well, I heard your interview earlier in the mo this morning with Simon Bridges. I think he was right. The fundamental reason why Māori can't access ordinary bank capital is the, the nature of the, the law around Māori land. Uh, that's been a problem for decades. I don't pretend it's easier to fix, but it is the fundamental problem. Allow Māori to use their land like anyone else can use their land and go to the bank if the bank can, can see a proposition. Mm. I, I reread your Ōrewa speech um, this morning, uh, delivered in 2004, and, you know, through it, you warn back then, 15 years ago now, almost to the day, pretty mm, much. That's right. Um, you warn about this divisive country that we could become. A, 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 I just quote you here, the dangerous drift towards racial separation in New Zealand. I mean, has any of the stuff that you warned about in here come to pass? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got a huge campaign, for example, of local government <clears throat> to create separate Maori wards for, for uh, in, in local districts. In, in Canterbury, we have a bill sponsored by the Canterbury Regional Council to allow Naitahu to appoint two voting councillors to the council. 
alongside the, the elected members. Now, that's, that's pernicious. Why do some New Zealanders, those who chance to have a Maori ancestor, have, it, in a sense, two political rights, one to vote as an ordinary citizen and one as a member of Naitahu to appoint a full voting member of the council. That's pernicious. Mm. That is exactly the separatism I was warning about 15 years ago. Yeah, we had two politicians on from different perspectives this morning basically saying that your message is not fit for purpose. Or it's best before data has gone. Uh, well, that's, well, what, that's, what, yeah, that's what Simon uh, Bridges said this morning. He said it wasn't nuanced enough for the modern world. And Shane Jones said uh, that time had passed you by. I, I wonder if they're right to the degree that when you first gave the speech, you rocketed up in the polls. I think it was the mm-hmm. Valentine's Day Massacre. I think we called it on TV One back in those days. Uh, and, you know, and there was a lot of resonance from people, um, or some people, <laughs> to, to what you were saying. But when you tried it, the souffle didn't rise again, did it? With, with the ACT Party and then as we moved on, your message still resonates with some, but but with very, very few. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, as I say, I think there's, there's a, as much need now, indeed arguably more need now, than there was 15 years ago. What, what I predicted 15 years ago is exactly what is happening, and people resent it. I mean, look at the Resource Management Act, for example, which the Simon Ridges government, national government, put in place, uh, what, a couple of years ago now. Mm. It's an outrageous situation. I mean, iwi have... Uh, political rights which other New Zealanders do not have. How can that be justified in a country where the treaty specifically said, Article 3, all New Zealanders have the same rights? Mm. So does it cut both ways in your view? If you have got this one law for all mm. um, principle, for example, just and there's, there's many I could, could use, but this example uh, from 2016, Northland Māori are twice as likely to go to jail than Pākehā when convicted of assault. Now, it's the same, same crime and twice as likely to go to jail uh, than Pākehā. At the, and, and you'd be well aware well, of many studies which have shown that for the same crime, Māori are far more likely to actually be imprisoned. So would you be campaigning against that? Oh, uh, clearly, yeah. we want a system in the justice system which is colour blind. Absolutely. So, so, why Fundamentally. so why haven't we got that, do well, you Well, I, I, I can't answer that yeah. question clearly, but clearly we don't have. But, but to be consistent with your... Because I'm, I'm sticking to your principle, right? Mm-hmm. So it's fair right. enough. I'm engaging on your terms. Right. You're saying one law for all. I just wonder whether you, to be intellectually honest, you should be campaigning as well, as well as the stuff that you talk about, where you see the injustice from the other side. I'm, I'm very happy to campaign for that too. Very happy. I want absolutely colourblind system in the justice system, in the education system, in the health system. So would you pledge to, you know, <laughs> would you pledge to, to, to look at that with your group, for example? Yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? I want a colourblind system. Where every, I mean, Simon Bridges, ironically, himself is Maori. You know, a quarter of our MPs are Maori. In what sense do we need special political privileges? Why do we need separate Maori electorates? They were justified in 1867, they're not justified now. And will that be part of your message when, well, you, it, when you go north? Uh, I'm, I'm not talking much about that, no. As I say, most of my speech is not about that. About economics. Uh, and I'm there to listen. Sorry, about... And, and I'm there to listen. OK, you're there to listen. Interesting. Thanks for your time this morning. You're very welcome. Do appreciate it. That is Don Brash. It's 19 minutes past eight. The first in-depth study of building products that burned in the fatal Grenfell Tower fire has produced alarming results. 72 people, you remember, died in the London apartment block 